Good to see all of you. So glad that you're here. My name is Joe Lachlan. I'm the lead pastor here. And if you're a guest this morning on behalf of the church, I just want to say welcome to all of you. And every Sunday is someone's first Sunday. And if that's you today, you're not alone. I've already met some others that today was their first Sunday. So just welcome. We're glad you're here. And I want to welcome those who are watching by live stream as well. Thank you so much for joining us. And we would love for you to come and worship with us in person sometime. We have two services on our classic venue at 8 and 9.30, and then two in the modern venue where we are right now at 9.30 and 11. And so uh, come join us sometime in person if you're able to do that. We would really appreciate it. And I'm the lead pastor, but I'm also one of the teaching team members. And so it's my turn to get to be in here today. Adam Duberly, as you know, our modern worship minister, preached next door in the classic venue today. And uh, so I'm preaching in here today, and I'm really glad to get to do that today. It's my turn because uh, this is actually my last Sunday to preach in here before I start my three-month sabbatical on June 3rd. If you don't know about that, um, this church has this incredible, like, crazy policy that once you've been here as a pastor seven years, then you, and I do that right at the end of May, then you get three months off sabbatical. And like, I've never had that. I'm in my 41st year of ministry and I've never heard of that, never had that. And I wasn't gonna like tell them, nah. So I, I'm doing it, okay? And I'm kind of scared about it. But anyway, I'm really, I'm really, uh, I'm gonna miss you and miss uh, my team that I work with every day. And so I'm, I'm just glad to get to be in here with you today. I really appreciate it. And I wanna say to the church, thank you for this gift. I, Valerie and I don't even know how to say thank you right for this. We've never had something like this. We, we don't even really know what to do with it. We're going to do our best to maximize it, and uh, we're going to rest. We're going to renew. We're going to recover. You know, like post-COVID, there's some recovery we need to do. You know, so we're just going to do all those things. So pray for us. We really appreciate it, and we just want to say thank you for this incredible gift uh, to, that you've given us in this way. We, we are so, so grateful. So today is Pentecost Sunday. And you might think that's kind of a made up, uh, invented by Hallmark holiday, you know. They've got so many out there, and you, you, you bound to know there's a conspiracy with some of those holidays, right? But Pentecost is not one of those kind of holidays. In fact, Pentecost Sunday has been around for a long, 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 long time. Even if you read in the Old Testament, you hear that centuries before Christ came, the Jewish people celebrated Pentecost. It was one of three festivals that drew them to Jerusalem every year. If you had any kind of commitment level as a member of the Jewish faith, you came to Jerusalem for Pentecost Sunday. And it was on one of those Pentecost Sunday festivals that God decided it was time for the Holy Spirit to come. He had promised the Holy Spirit to the believers to come. Jesus had left them uh, to go ascend after he was crucified, resurrected. He ascended back to the Father. And uh, as he ascended to the Father, he had told them, wait all together for the Holy Spirit to show up. And that's what happened. So we find the believers all together. By this time, with all the ebb and flow and growth and decrease of the number of disciples through his ministry days and his preaching and his controversy and then his being beaten and then crucified, the disciples had scattered. And then after his resurrection, he spent about 40 days speaking to uh, different people and had amassed a following of about 120 very serious committed followers of Jesus. So we find them all together in one place and we pick up the story in Acts chapter two. So if you're willing, take a copy of God's word or open up the church app, uh, look for the modern venue scriptures or open up a blue letter Bible or Bible gateway on your phone or wherever. I don't mind you using electronic Bible as not as long as you're not ordering groceries while you're doing it. All right. Or, or lunch to pick up on the way out. And I'm thinking, oh, great. Now give me the idea. Okay. As if you didn't already have it. All right. So anyway, Acts chapter two, and <laughs> we pick up on Pentecost Sunday. I'm glad you're with me already. That's good. Oh, and by the way, I'm going to be kind of like moving through some stuff today. I'm going to be doing a lot of scriptures today. In fact, I'm concerned that two things are probably going to happen today while I'm preaching. One of the things is I'm going to hit your saturation point. I don't know when that's going to be. Maybe I already have. I don't know. But I'm going to hit your saturation point, and you're going to be going like, I'm out. I'm, I'm done. That's all I can handle. Okay, great. Whatever. That's fine. Okay, just glad you're here. The second thing is, <laughs> at some point, you're going to come to this conclusion. Maybe everybody in the room is, oh, I get it now. He's not going to get to preach for three months, so he's giving us the whole summer right now in this sermon. Okay? So maybe that happens too. I don't know. Acts chapter 2, we see about Pentecost. This is where it happens. Uh, and in the text where it says they, we're talking about the 120 people, okay? So, Acts chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they, the 120, were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. 
They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now what happened next is they went out into the city where all these throngs had gathered from all over that part of the world to come and celebrate the festival of Pentecost on this Jewish holiday. And as people came, these 120 went out and with these new tongues that they had never studied, they were able to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with people in their native language. People were hearing all kinds of languages, and they were hearing their own. And, and I'll tell you, that is one of the signs the Spirit showed up right there. That's what happened. And this actually happened to me one time. I was preaching in Monterey, Mexico. And I was preaching through a translator because, smart wetero here, uh, when I was in high school in a town that had about 65% Hispanics, I... <laughs> I hauled off and took French for my foreign language in high school. Yep. Like I use that every day in Texas, right? I just kicked myself. Anyway, I was having to preach through a translator, and I was preaching, and I remember specifically this native, spe native Spanish speaker was my translator, and uh, I got to a point in my sermon and read some scripture that stumped my translator. He turned to me and said, I don't know how to say that phrase in Spanish. And guys, I'm not kidding. I didn't know the phrase, but this is what I did. I said, well, I think it's this, and I said in Spanish, and it was exactly the phrase that was needed in right there. I, I'd never studied it. I didn't speak enough Spanish to know that. I just feel like it was the Spirit of God giving me that gift in a moment where I did that. In fact, it kind of cracked the translator up, cracked the whole congregation up, because they were thinking, like, what does this white guy need a translator for anyway, okay? But anyway, I just kept preaching in English. He kept preaching in Spanish, and it was one of those things where it just blew our minds. But I think it was a gift from the Holy Spirit in that moment. To this day, I don't even remember what the phrase was that I used. I know the section I was missing, but anyway, if I told you Spanish speakers, you'd be able to tell me what it was, all right? So I, it was an amazing thing. It happened. And so what happened here in Pentecost is all these people began to hear the gospel in their own native language from people that had never studied those languages because the Spirit of God had filled them. Now, the skeptics that were really doubting Jesus was legit showed up, of course, at this festival, and what they said was, well, they've just been drinking. They, they, they're drunk. That's why they're able to do this. Now, I don't know how drunk people can all of a sudden learn to speak a new language that anybody can understand, okay? You get what I'm saying, right? You know where I went there on that, all right? Yeah, where they could actually be understood, but that's what they were claiming. Peter stepped up, took leadership, and he said, no, guys, it's nine o'clock in the morning. They're not drunk. This is what's happening. And he began to describe how a prophecy that the prophet Joel had preached centuries before Christ was coming to be fulfilled. And he quoted the, the prophet Joel, and it's recorded in Acts chapter 2, verse 16. Peter says, no, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, or as we would say today, preach. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy or preach. By the way, this is why we feel a freedom at First Temple to have women preach on our teaching team. Because we believe that what Peter was saying is the last days of the spirit of God falling on both men and women have come. Ever since the day of Pentecost, that's been the way it is. So men and women will preach. And so that's what, why we do it. But he explained all of that. Now, this caused great confusion, even among the believers, even among the disciples who had been told the Holy Spirit was coming. Just like that day in Monterey, Mexico, when I preached. I mean, I was so shocked that happened. That night, I called from Mexico uh, to our home in Waco and talked to Valerie about it. I just wanted to make an international call to tell her this. It was like crazy that it had happened, and I couldn't wait to get back. So I called her and tried to explain it to her, and I, I don't know that I did a really good job. She probably thought, oh, goodness, he's been drinking. Okay, so anyway, uh, I don't know, but anyway, it was just an incredible thing. It was caused lots of confusion. And so uh, that happens. But here's the thing. It shouldn't have caused confusion because Jesus had already warned them the Spirit was coming. So let's do this. Let's stop in Acts chapter 2 at, on the day of Pentecost, and let's look at 10 days earlier. Okay? 10 days earlier. Look with me just one page back in the text in Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, as he was getting ready to ascend back to the right hand of the Father. Now, here's what's happened. He's been crucified 
three days later, raised from the grave, ministered to about 500 different people, saw him and talked with him over a 40-day period. And then he's about to ascend back into heaven to be at the right hand of the Father. This is 10 days before Pentecost Sunday, and this is what he says in Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. It says, on one occasion, while Jesus was eating with the disciples, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? <laughs> this is a reminder that they didn't get it. They, they missed it. He was going to talk to them about the coming of the Holy Spirit. And they were still looking for like the kingdom to be tran transferred back to Israel, where Israel would be in power instead of the Roman Empire. Come on, guys. Like, y'all aren't getting it. Okay? So, yeah, that's what the disciples were. And it gives, if you ever feel like you don't really get God, you, you in real good company, okay? Just wanted you to know that because we all get there sometimes. We even have hindsight on this. We read about it and still some of it is confusing to us. Jesus wasn't stopped by that. Verse 7, he says, he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Basically, what Jesus said to them, once you have the Holy Spirit, I want you to go and be the church, like we tell you every Sunday on the way out the door, okay? That's what Jesus told them. I want you to go and be my witnesses. I want you to go and be the church. Now, what he describes here is this, the receiving of the Holy Spirit. And in, already in Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost Sunday, and in Acts chapter 1, where Jesus 10 days earlier gave them instructions about what was going to happen, he uses several different ways to describe what happens when the Holy Spirit comes? The Holy Spirit comes, the Holy Spirit baptizes, the Holy Spirit fills, they receive the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit leads, all these different things. There's different ways to describe the one thing of the Spirit coming into the life of a believer. Now, they didn't get it. Just like there are times when you and I don't get God. So what I want to do is I want to We've gone 10 days back from Pentecost. I want to go even 40 days earlier than that and see what Jesus talked to them about the night before he was crucified. So let's look over in the Gospel of John. Now, Matthew, Mark, Luke, Matthew, Mark, and Luke give us the description of what Jesus says when he starts the tradition we call communion or the Lord's Supper. Or maybe you have a faith tradition uh, that uses the word Eucharist, okay? We usually say communion here or the Lord's Supper here at First Temple, Okay. When he instituted that, Matthew, Mark, and Luke give us kind of the, 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 the script that he used to kind of introduce that with the bread and the juice. And by the way, we'll practice that in here next Sunday, okay? Our whole hour will be dedicated to communion next Sunday. So I hope you'll be here for that. If you're online, I hope you'll come and join us for that. We practice open communion where all believers, regardless of their church membership or denominational affiliation, get to participate with us. If you're a follower of Jesus, we're going to invite you to the table to share communion with us together. All right? It's going to be a great day. But what John does, the Gospel of John is different. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke talk about the specifics of communion and the Lord's Supper. The Gospel of John, what happens is he includes all the talk around the table that Jesus had with the disciples that the other three don't share. And what happens is, is that Jesus begins to talk to them about how he's about to depart. He's trying to tell them about how he's going to have to go to be crucified, to pay for their sins, to start this new covenant in his blood, he talks about as he introduces communion. And they are freaking out because they've been following Jesus through thick and thin. And now all of a sudden he's talking about leaving them behind and they're freaking out. And what he does is he tries to calm them and assure them that he's actually not going to leave them alone. He's going to send the Holy Spirit. He calls it the Spirit of Truth, His Spirit. So it's the Holy Spirit, it's the Spirit of Truth. It is Christ's Spirit. In fact, it's really cool what He does. He talks to them in this way Hey, it's actually going to be to your advantage that I do this because right now I'm just with you. But once I depart and the Spirit comes, the Spirit won't be with you, He'll be in you. So Christ, 40 days before He ascends, and 50 days before Pentecost Sunday, 
tells them about how it is the Spirit's going to come and live inside them. You and I have talked about how cool it would be if we could have lived during the time of Jesus when he was walking the earth and how we maybe would have gotten to be able to like be with him and hang out with him and have meals with him and like, you know, just be with him when he's right there asking questions. Like that'd be so cool. Jesus said, you've got something better. I'm sending your spirit so that I won't just be with you. I will be in you. I will fill you. I will lead you. I will baptize you. Here's how he describes it in John chapter 14, verses 16 through 18. He says, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper or advocate or comforter to help you and to be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept the spirit because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you will know him for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. He's saying, I will come to you in the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God will come and live inside you. The next page in my Bible, two chapters over, chapter 16, verses um, 12 through 14, this is what he says. I have many more things. He's still at the table talking with these guys about his departure. They're still freaking out. They're not getting it. You and I would be freaking out too. Sometimes we feel like God's left us and abandoned us, and we're going like, what's up, God? Why in the world are you? Where are you? Where are you? We feel that way now, even though the Spirit is already living in us. Jesus says, I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear, but when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. Now, he won't speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. So Jesus has talked about this, and one of the things that when we talk about the Holy Spirit happens is that there's still a lot of confusion. In fact, to be honest with you, uh, those of us in the kind of Baptist faith tradition really don't spend a whole lot of time talking about or teaching about the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit kind of wigs us out just a little bit. We just kind of get freaked out by the Holy Spirit, and it's because we're un- we don't know about the Holy Spirit. That unknown is, is, is huge for us. And one of the big questions is, when does the Spirit come? Now, because for the early believers, these first group of believers, it was like 50 days after Jesus raised from the grave. And there are some who believe that the Holy Spirit comes later after you become a believer. And you get to a level of spirituality or a level of depth or following Jesus to where then he baptizes you at a later time or in a second baptism with his spirit. And if you're from that faith tradition or watching online, if you're from that faith tradition, I I don't intend to insult anyone or beat anybody up. I'll just tell you at First Temple, we actually teach that now after this first initial arrival of the Holy Spirit at day of Pentecost, we believe that the scriptures teach that when you become a believer, you at the exact same time are given the Holy Spirit to live inside of you. That's the source of the new life that comes into you through the Holy Spirit of God, the presence of Christ inside you. And we get that from a verse in the Paul, Paul's letter to the Romans. In Romans chapter 8, verse 9, this is what he says to the Roman believers. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are now in the realm of the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they actually don't belong to Christ. So we don't think it's possible for you to be a believer in Jesus and belong to Christ and not have been given the Holy Spirit of God. So we believe it's one in the same thing. Now, in our faith tradition, one of the reasons that we uh, kind of get wigged out a little bit is because of in the next few months and years that these early believers experienced faith, in Jerusalem, as the scriptures say, they begin to spread out and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. They begin to, begin to discover what Paul refers to as gifts of the Spirit. So one of the gifts of the Spirit is like the tongues gift that I talked about earlier in uh, the day of Pentecost, where they were able to speak known languages uh, and speak in tongues that other people could recognize and know from their native language, even though they had never studied that, like I did down in Mexico that one time for a brief phrase. But we Baptists get wigged out by that sort of stuff. We get freaked out by that sort of thing because we, especially when it comes to the gifts that are like what we call like ecstatic gifts or like specialty gifts that have to do with like miracles and healings and uh, resurrections and 
speaking in tongues. We get, a little, we get a little freaked out about that. In fact, I have to tell you, I have to be really careful about telling that story about what happened to me in Mexico that time. Because if I tell that to certain people of a certain faith tradition, even in the Baptist faith tradition that I have, and I know we're online here, so here we go. Uh, you know, I, when I tell that in certain settings, people get all freaked out because that dude speaks in tongues. Are you kidding me? First Baptist Church Temple has a pastor that spoke in tongues one time. Yep, two words in Spanish I did in Monterey, Mexico. Yeah, <laughs> deal with it, all right? Well, we get freaked out about that. One of the reasons we get freaked out about that is because a lot of times, People put the emphasis on the gifts to the point where it's all about the gifts. In other words, that if you're of a special level spiritually, you'll have these gifts. They're reserved for the most holy people, the ones who are closest to Jesus. The Bible makes it clear what the gifts are for. The gifts are not for us to know who is super spiritual. In fact, the scriptures tell us that the gifts are not even for the benefit or certainly not the glory of the person who possesses the gift. The benefit is for the person who received the ministry of the gift. So that night in Monterey, Mexico, the benefit wasn't for me as a preacher to all of a sudden be given two words in Spanish I did not know ahead of time and therefore become some celebrity or superstar. And isn't that what our culture does with those who have certain gifts? But it was for the benefit of a people who needed to hear a message that the content of which had stumped the translator. And the Spirit said, no problem. Here you go, Joe. All right, that's enough. He'll take it from here. Because the need... Rose up. In fact, I think that tells us something about the gifts. Sometimes the gifts are resident in us. I think probably all of us have one or two gifts that are resident with us all the time. And then I think occasionally in certain situations that God will give a particular gift to us through his spirit because of the need of that particular moment. Like me that night when my translator got stumped. This guy had spoken Spanish his entire life. Knew it before he knew English and an English phrase in the scriptures stumped him. That was an immediate kind of temporary gifting that God had given me. I still know more French than I do Spanish, okay? All right? Well, I know enough Spanish, well, you know, gosh, the Spanish I know I can't use in church. I learned it in eighth grade locker room. Can I get an amen? Yeah. It it comes in handy. You you gotta know when to leave a situation, and so I know when I'm getting called. I know when it's time to, bye, I'm out of here, adios. All right, here we go. Yeah, I know when it's time to get out and leave. All right, yeah. So I want you to hear this about the, the gifts. I want you to hear this real quick in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul talks about the gifts. Because here's the thing, I don't want to belittle the gifts, but I I don't want us to put too much emphasis on them. Because the gifts are a means to an end. They're not the end in themselves. Ever. Ever, 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 ever. In fact, the Spirit of God, a lot of times what happens is people even overemphasize the gifts or they overemphasize the Spirit. And Jesus has already told us that the Spirit is not here to glorify himself. The Spirit is never going to put the spotlight on the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is always going to put the spotlight where? On Christ, the Savior. He's always going to give glory to Christ, not himself. Hear what Paul says about the gifts. Now, about the gifts of the Spirit, Romans chapter, uh, sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. Now, about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. And then verses 7 through 11. Now, to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Let me read that again. Now, to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. If someone is up here leading worship or preaching or teaching or leading in prayer, reading Scripture, and they are demonstrating gifts of the Spirit of God, it is not for their benefit. It is for the masses' benefit. It is for the good of the whole and the glory of Christ. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom, to another a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by that one Spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy or preaching, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues. Not everyone was intended to experience 
the gift of tongues. It is, it is not a test of spirituality and certainly is not a test of salvation. It is one of many tongues that we might, from time to time, see in someone in a particular need or situation. And then also another is given the inter- interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one in the same spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. Christ determines who gets what gift. Now, here's the thing about the gifts I want you to know. Where we get into trouble is when we overemphasize the gifts, when we use them as a test for spirituality, and when we say that we are going to put the focus on the Holy Spirit who does not want any glory. The Spirit wants all the glory to go to Christ. I want to share one more thing with you before the band comes out and we we sing another song and then we'll go, okay? The thing that really determines our level of spirituality is not the gifts of the Spirit. It's not particular gifts of the Spirit. There is something the Scriptures talk about being a test of spirituality, a measure by which we know how much we are following Christ and know how much someone else is following Christ And it has nothing to do with the spiritual gift. It has something else to do with the Spirit of God. Paul writes about it in Galatians chapter 5, verse 23, when he talks about the fruit of the Spirit. Not the gifts, but the fruit of the Spirit. This is what he says. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Let me read that list again. Love, joy, peace, patience or forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's the fruit of the Spirit. Now, sometimes what happens is we look at the gifts of the Spirit and we say, okay, the gifts of the Spirit, nobody has all of them. We're supposed to have maybe one or two, and then every once in a while God will give us one when we really need it in a particular situation So that's the gifts. So the fruit must be the same way. Because I recognize I got this and that one, but that one I'm never going to have. That's just not me. No. (laughs) The fruit of the Spirit is different. The fruit of the Spirit actually is all-inclusive for all of us. And that the closer we get to Christ, the more we demonstrate not the gifts of the Spirit, but the fruit of the Spirit. Now, I've talked about Pentecost Sunday and 10 days before that and 40 days before that. And then I've talked about the next few months and years of the early church. Now I want to jump 2,000 years in advance to today and talk about what this means for you and me. We have a mission statement here at First Temple. It's on the screen. I want you to see it, and I want you to read it out loud with me, okay? So our mission statement is this. Read it with me out loud leading those far from God to encourage him and grow in the ways of Christ. That last phrase, the ways of Christ, is where the Spirit of God comes in and grows us into the ways of Christ. What are the ways of Christ? How do we know that someone is really walking closely with Jesus? How do we know that we ourselves are actually becoming more like Christ, behaving like Christ? Being like Jesus, the ways of Christ show up in our lives. What are those ways? They are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That's when we know We are under the leadership of the Spirit. This is what he says next. It won't be on the screen. Listen to it. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions passions and desires. So since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit brings about that fruit in our lives. The good and lasting work of the Spirit of God in you and in me. Okay. If I hit your saturation point, cool. I do encourage you to keep studying this stuff. Learn about the Spirit of God. Don't be afraid of the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is inside you, leading you, guiding you. Embrace the Spirit of God. Let's pray. 
Father, we say thank you, first of all. Just thank you for your salvation in Christ. Lord, thank you for sending a Savior for us. And Lord, if there's someone here today that doesn't have you as their Savior, Lord, would you? Would you? Well, Lord, I'm going to ask you to pour out your love on them to such a depth and level that they can no longer say no to you. Lord, I know you won't use guilt because that doesn't work with us humans. I know you won't use pressure. I know you won't use scientific fact because you want us to have faith. So, Lord, I just pray that you would love people who don't know you so much that they can no longer deny you. They experience your love in such a real way where they step toward you. And, Lord, we thank you for the gift of the Spirit of God. What an incredible thing it is for you to not just be with us, but be in us and guide us and lead us. Lord, we thank you for the gifts that you've made resident within us for our day-to-day going out and being the church, but we know that also if we get ourselves in a situation that we're no match for, you'll step up and you'll give us a particular gift in a moment like you did for me and through me in Monterey, Mexico. It's never happened since. It might not ever happen again, but I know it happened then. And I want to say thank you. And Lord, more than anything, may we truly become more like Christ so that people around us see the fruit of your spirit working within us. Lord, thank you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.